Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello, welcome back to Fighting on Film. Now, we mentioned last week that this week would be Yesterday's Enemy, featuring Marcus Hernan, who is head of library and archive at Hammer Films. And what better film to have Marcus on for? Really excited to have you on the show, Marcus. Welcome. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. So in a change of pace this week, Marcus has agreed to run us through the production. So Marcus, take it away. Wow. Yesterday's Enemy is a film that I don't get asked about as often as I'd like, because it's, I think it's one of the very best films that Hammer ever made. Val Guest uh, used to tell me that it was certainly on his list of the best films that he'd ever made. It was one of the very few Hammer films to receive any serious awards recognition, in this case from BAFTA. And it was a very commercially successful film at the time, and yet it's unfairly, I think, overlooked within the broader canon of British war films. And I think um, it's also unfairly overlooked in the canon of Hammer's films, despite the fact it stars Stanley Baker, Ian McKern, directed by the great Val Guest, as I mentioned earlier, top-notch production designed by Bernard Robinson and widely considered as one of the most um, authentic-looking war films of its period as well. I mean, it would be quite interesting to talk about why it doesn't receive broader recognition. It's interesting that it it doesn't seem to appear on TV much at all anymore, at all, really. I I can't remember the last time I saw it in the listings. I think one of the issues with Yesterday's Enemy is that it deals with, more than anything else, it deals with moral ambiguity. Mm, yeah, that sets it apart from the vast majority of war films produced in this period. It's about men on a mission, but it's not a men on a mission movie. Ultimately, it deals with the very thorny subject of British war crimes. And I think because of its uh, moral ambiguity, because it's difficult to pin down in that respect, I think that's part of the reason why it's been overlooked because it's difficult to categorise. I think the broad perception of Hammer's films, certainly during this period, certainly of its horror films, is that Hammer dealt in melodrama. And uh, this is another example. Yesterday's Enemy is another example of a film that doesn't comply with that conception or misconception of Hammer, because um, not only is it a morally um, ambiguous, um, ambiguous film, it's also one of their most clinical films as well. Again... I think, um, makes it difficult to categorise within canon. And I think that uh, we don't like things that are difficult to categorise. And I think that's one of the reasons, uh, it's two or two of the reasons there, why I think it's been overlooked. Mm -hmm. People that understand the way that Hammer Horror works will tell you that, um, that Hammer's horror films dealt in moral ambiguity all the time. I mean, the best example being Peter Cushing's Frankenstein who is the villain that you're kind of rooting for in quite a lot of the films. And even, you know, even one or two of the Dracula films, notably Taste the Blood of Dracula, where Dracula himself is turned into an anti-hero. Hammer was not um, as black and white in its horror films um, as many people consider. But here was a case of them actually applying that ambiguity to a war film. I think the other thing that's important to bear in mind about Yesterday's Enemy is it's very difficult to have any conversation about Yesterday's Enemy without also considering the camp on Blood Island. Yes, yeah. Which is the war film that preceded it. They're both sides of a very interesting coin. It's another guest movie as well, isn't it? It's another our guest movie, yes. And I think that um, Hammer had a scandalous, uh, had a scandalous reputation in the late 1950s. You know, I think that um, along with commercial television and rock and roll, I think it was, um, uh, I think it was one of the things that was responsible for the liberalisation of British post-war culture. In oh, that. Wow. And, and now people look back on Hammer's output 
And the films that um, uh, exemplify Hammer's scandalous approach are, are generally thought to be Dracula, the Christopher Lee, or the Curse of Frankenstein, or Peter Cushing. I would actually argue that the most scandalous, the most outrageous, the most shocking film that Hammer made during its so-called golden age of the late 1950s was actually not a horror film per se, but a war film, and it was The Camp on Blood Island. Um, the Camp on Blood Island was a film that caused widespread outrage at the time. It's the only Hammer film to have its, its posters banned by London Transport. Uh, and this is despite the fact that um, Hammer pointed, uh, Ham Hammer claimed that it was inspired by a true story of Japanese war crimes. Nevertheless, they were, they were roundly condemned for trying to turn an appalling chapter of the war into entertainment. They were roundly condemned for actually turning a story, whether it be true or not, of British prisoners of war in a Japanese, in a Japanese camp into some kind of, uh, of exploiting that for some kind of hammer horror style entertainment. My father, in fact, tells me that um, uh, in the late 1950s, when him and his friends tried to get into cinemas you know, to see X-rated films, um, even though they weren't old enough, the one that you had to get into, the one that was a real rite of passage, was The Camp on Blood Island. And he tells me that him and his, him and his teenage friends actually managed to get into a screening of The Camp on Blood Island in 1958. And this was considered, you know, having seen the camp on Blood Island at that age was considered a real badge of honour. And, of course, we have to bear in mind that the film was so notorious that there's even a sketch about it in Monty Python's Flying Circus, isn't there? Oh. But the point I'm trying to get to, and how this relates to Yesterday's Enemy, is that although the camp on Blood Island was very commercially successful, it caused serious and, I think, irreparable damage to, to, Hammer's, to Hammer's standing within the industry. It was very, very quickly, although Hammer publicly um, defended Camp on Blood Island from its critics, I believe at board of director level, they were smarting from the criticisms. And I think they felt very quickly that something had to be done to try to fix their reputation. And Camp on Blood Island had only recently gone on release, I think it had been around for a couple of weeks, when someone on Hammer's board of directors saw the BBC television play Yesterday's Enemy. I recommended that Hammer should go into production on a film that dealt with British war crimes. That's how it made the transition from television to cinema. It was, it was a frantic effort to make amends, to try to restore companies' damaged reputation. You would think that perhaps portraying in, in that period in a, in an establishment um, period where portraying a war crime by British soldiers would be you know, even worse than anything that could have been imagined in, in Blood Island, really, wouldn't you? But it's an interesting way of um, trying to address that situation. It's, a, it's an obvious way, I suppose. It's, it's a knee-jerk reaction. Mm. But you have to bear in mind that even then, Hammer had, had quite strong links with the establishment. Um, Lieutenant Colonel James Carreras, MBE, who was the managing director of Hammer, was a friend of Lord Mountbatten mm -hmm. and, um, and a friend of the Duke of Edinburgh as well. I mean, he was subsequently knighted um, uh, in the late 1960s. Hammer won the Queen's Award, uh, the Queen's Award to Industry for their export achievements. And so they had, um, it, was, it was a company that, uh, despite its scandalous reputation, <clears throat> actually had uh, very strong links with the establishment. The idea that, uh, the, the idea that uh, this, this, this perception in 1958 that they had taken um, Japanese war crimes and trying to turn them into what was already being known as hammer horror. I think embarrassing for them, actually. And Camp on Blood Island, we're talking about yesterday's enemy being overlooked. I mean, the Camp, I mean, Camp on Blood Island cast a long... Even more so, yeah. Yeah, over Hammer for decades. But, I mean, Camp on Blood Island is a film that, until very recently, hadn't been on British television at all. I don't think it had been screened on British television since the 1970s. I think it's turned up on Talking Pictures. Probably has, mm. yeah. The I don't think it had been on television for around 40 years. Wow. Going off that, there's a review I found actually talking about the, the uh, way it was received that I found from 
the Eastbourne Gazette uh, on Wednesday, the October 7th, 1959. We'll join the review halfway through and it'll also explain a little bit of the plot for us. So it says, it tells the story of a group of British soldiers, remnants of a strong fighting force, slogging their way through Burma jungle, pressing their way forward for they know that to stop means death. The film is something more than just another war film, as evidenced by the fact that it has already received many tributes from men who knew action in Burma, including Major General A.H.J. Snelling, Major General H.L. Davies, and ex-Sergeant Freddie Tompkins, who is currently Public Relations Officer to the Burma Star Association. So I thought that was really interesting that this film gets plaudits, whereas Camp on Blood Island didn't. Mm. So I thought that was really well, interesting. Peter there. Newman, who wrote the Camp on Blood Island, initially, I mean, um, he'd written the television version. Initially, it's very interesting. If you look at Hammond's very early publicity for the film, Newman actually claimed that it was, it was based on a true story. He claimed that it was a story that had been told to oh, really? an ex-serviceman. But this is never mentioned again in any of the subsequent publicity. And there was a lot of publicity put out by Hammer for this film. They even, they even printed a special booklet, which we have in the Hammer archive, called Yesterday's Enemy, The Film and Its Challenge. Oh, wow. A, a three-way conversation between Michael Carrera, the executive producer, Val Guest, the director, and Peter Newman, the author, about the ethics. Um, that uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a philosophical conversation prompted by the ethical debate at the heart of the film. and. This idea that Newman has based this on a true story isn't mentioned anywhere in that, I don't think. It's almost as if, and this is pure speculation on my part, it's almost as if somebody says, look, we did all that based on a true story with Camp on Blood Island. It didn't get us anywhere. Can we just forget it? Mm. You no, know, whether that's what happened or not. I mean, uh, Anthony Nelson Keyes, the Hammer producer, claims that it was a story that it was actually hand-delivered to him at Hammer House in Wardour Street by a former prisoner of war. But, wow. Oh, wow. Don't know if that's actually true or not. Nobody knows. This, this idea that yesterday's enemy was based on a true story is, is mentioned very briefly at the beginning and then just quietly dropped. Well, Newman himself was a veteran. Uh, we know that much, but I, I couldn't find a great deal. I know, I know he was one of the, the, the technical advisors officially on the film as well, apparently. Is that right? Uh, well, he was a screenwriter. There isn't an awful lot known about him. I did participate in a documentary about him once, which appears on his, um, the DVD of his Doctor Who story, The Censorites. He only had two commissions, two film or television commissions in his entire career and died quite young. Sadly. So it was uh, Yesterday's Enemy, film and television versions, and the, the Doctor Who story, The Censorites from 1964, are the only things that um, he was actually commissioned for. So he's... Um, Turned it into a play as well, I believe. Uh, for, for the theatre, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, did he? I didn't know that. Okay. I think so. Yeah. I, think, I think it was after the film came out. But he was a guy who, I think it's fair to say, struggled to make a living from writing. Mm. And I think he ended his career at the National Gallery, where I think he, where I believe he had an accident. Yeah, I read something about that. I think he had a fall. I think he was a porter um, or something like that, and he had a fall. So it, it, it's a sad story, really. And, it uh, is, but yesterday's enemy is quite the epitaph, though. You, yeah. I, I would oh, say. Well, yeah, absolutely, yeah. But, you know, he, uh, Hammer did subsequently commission him for a film about the Spanish Inquisition, and um, there was a film called Duncan Webb Crime Reporter that they wanted him to make. There was talk of him working on a Western as well. And oh, wow. But um, there, are, there are copious notes in the archive, and he had a fractious relationship with Hammer. Right. Um, yesterday's enemy and their relationship with Peter Newman were part of an effort by Michael Carreras, who was one of the two executive producers at Hammer, to actually broaden Hammer's output. Because even by that stage, by 1958, 1959, he was becoming restless and there was a concern within Hammer that they were becoming typecast as horror producers. And so there was a period uh, over, those, uh, over those few years where they, where they make uh, Yesterday's Enemy, um, a film about child abuse called Never Take Sweets from a Stranger, uh, another Stanley Baker film called Hell is a City. Oh, mm-hmm. yes, yeah. Where they're actually trying to be something different. They're actually trying to maintain the variety they had in their output before Quatermass, Dracula and Frankenstein, quote unquote, typecast them. So Peter Newman and Yesterday's Enemy were very important to Hammer, especially yeah. after they you know, made this war film, The Camp on Blood Island, that had been widely perceived as a Hammer horror, you know, mm. um, because of the brutality, et cetera, because of the exploitation angle. And so yeah. um, Enemy was exactly where 
Michael Carreras thought Hammer needed to be at this point. And I think of all of those experiments, it's, it's arguably, or those experiments away from horror, it's arguably the most accomplished. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I would agree. I really love the way it's made because I, I think it's it's some of Arthur Grant, the cinematographer's best work, I think, in the way it's shot. And that mm. production design from Robinson that you mentioned, mm. it just doesn't look studio bound. When no. you compare it to something like The Longer Short and the Tall, which is so mm. clearly studio bound, um, mm. the, the sound design on it, it doesn't have that, sound staged feel to it it, it just mm. feels like a very well-made film it, it, it seems they threw everything at it well what was interesting about the production on that res- in that respect was that it was shot at shepperton which hammer didn't normally use because hammer had its own studio at bray but mm. bray wasn't big enough to actually give them the expansive jungle they needed and so they that went- makes sense because it does feel quite Oh, it's, it's much, yeah. You, I mean, there's there's no comparison between that and, you know, Curse of Frankenstein, Revenge of Frankenstein, Dracula, the films that were shot at Bray at the time, which are masterpieces. They are beautiful, sumptuous films, but are clearly made on much smaller sound stages. Mm. Um, and Robinson, who was a genius, um, one of the most important um, production people at Hammer, devised a system of um, interlocking sets which I, as far as I recall, were actually um, were actually designated A through to J. And if you look at Val Guest's script for Yesterday's Enemy, you can see his notes about how the sets lock together, <clears throat> and they were interchangeable in parts as well. And so he could move them around. Oh, that's so cool! Yeah, to actually create extended bits. Yeah, so like when they're walking through bits, it looks like they're walking further and it isn't just, yeah, that, that's so interesting. It's hard to remember. So the sets were kind of pulled apart and put back together in a different order throughout the shoot. And Guest had to remember, he had to make notes on his script about which actors were portraying characters that were supposed to be alive or dead at various points because he had to shoot <laughs> yeah. in order to be, in order to make the sets work in the best way. And so he'd have a list of, you know, of so of, of which character had yet to be shot by the Japanese, etc., or which one was still alive, etc. And he remembered it very well. And um, and apparently, while they were while they were pulling the sets apart and putting them back together again, the actors would apparently run poker schools, you know, um, while they were while they were waiting for these bits sets. And we actually have photographs in the archive of them doing this uh, while they were putting the various sort of sections of these interlinking sets together. It wasn't all shot at Shepperton. Some of it was shot at Bray. I think the swamp scenes were shot at Bray. And then um, Hammer, um, or Bernard Robinson, as, as economically minded as ever, then recycled parts of the swamp sets for the very next Hammer film that was in production, which was The Mummy. Ah. Swamp, uh, The Mummy, when Christopher Lee, as The Mummy, comes out, of, uh, comes out of the swamp, it's actually the Yesterday's Enemy, Burma Swamp. Oh, exactly. Wow. I, never, I can't say I'd ever noticed that. I, I wouldn't have twigged. <laughs> well, he, was, he was a master of his craft, Robin. Yeah. But even then, because it was shot at Shepperton, this meant Hammer coming out of its house studio, where, of course, it had its own permanent staff, etc. There were approximately 130 staff um, at Bray, etc. And they had, to, they had to hire an outside studio to do this, which they didn't normally do, and they didn't like doing it. It ended up being a relatively expensive film for them. It cost about £125,000. Mm-hmm. Which, by Hammer, by Hammer standards, was quite a lot of money. Yeah. It, that's again, that's, not, know, that's no small amount in, in 59. Sure. Testament to the fact that they're taking this seriously. This is a prestige production for them. Oh, and it shows, it shows. And it's such a strong cast as well. Could be, with, with a prestige production, yeah. you've got a cast that is, it's, it's pretty standout. There's some, there's some great stuff in there. Mm. Well, Val, I think that's probably down to Val, really, because Val Guest, yeah. I mean, it's interesting in itself that they got Val to direct it because, of course, he was the person who was, so it's largely responsible. Yeah, of course, because he wrote Blood and directed Island. Blood Island. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm. yeah. And so getting getting the same director back to show the other side of the coin, um, obviously a deliberate move on their part. But of course, Val brought Val, although he was the guy who launched Ham, had launched Hammer Horror with the Quasi Mass experiment, he was never really a house director in the way that um, Terence Fisher was at Hammer. Right. Val was the he had very strong links to Hammer, but he was also kind of independent. He had a mm-hmm. career outside the studio as well, which by this stage, Terence Fisher sadly didn't really. Um, uh, not a career of any note, unfortunately, by this stage, because Terence Fisher himself had become typecast 
by Hammer Horror, I think. Now, Val Guest um, told me himself that he always avoided gothic horror as a subject, maybe because he didn't want to be typecast the way some of his colleagues had. Uh, that, that would make Val sense. Guest was able to operate independently, and Val Guest loved using Shepperton. He used Shepperton a lot, but he also brought with him his own Darasset repertory company of actors, and that's mm. We see Stanley Baker. That's why we see Leo McKern. That's why we see Gordon Jackson. That's why we see Burt Kwok, actually, um, who's part of that. Who's part of that rep company? I mean, Leo. Uh, um, I mean, Baker. He would also direct in in Hell Is a City. Um, uh, Leo McKern is, you know, so, so memorable from the day the Earth caught fire. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Some would yeah, some would maintain is you know um, one of Guest's best films, if not his best, etc. And so. What you're looking at here is a is a hammer backed production, but directed by an independent directed by Val Guest, who's also very much you know an independent spirit. Guest has such an interesting career trajectory. So during the war, he does a Ministry of Information film. He wrote one of those, and then he did Arthur Askew films. Well, in fact, he was making a film. He was making a film with the, he brought the Crazy Gang back together. He, he's, he's doing the Crazy Gang's reunion film, Life Is a Circus. I think when they approach him to do this. I think, and so he was—he was an incredible guy, Val. I mean, he was so versatile. He could, you know, he could do spy thrillers. He could do screwball comedies. I think screwball comedy might have been, you know, his real passion. Actually, he was—he was an astonishing director. He really was, and he was, I think, at the absolute peak of his powers when he made this. Well, I—I I, I mentioned it before we started recording, but I mean, I love the two Quatermass movies he did. I think they're two of the best. I think Experiment and Quatermass Two are just amongst my favorites. The way they move, although they were shot, although the experiment was shot in 54, this and, and Quatermass too shortly after, they don't move like 1950s British films at all. Cutting of those films and the sharp dialogue, they are so fast. Quatermass 2 moves so fast that you don't, if you actually sit down and think about it, bits of it just don't actually make sense because <laughs> jettisoned so many parts of the original script just in an effort to keep the thing moving. But I think with Yesterday's Enemy, He's trying to create something rather different. In Yesterday's Enemy, he's almost recalling the work he did on the Quatermass experiment, because the Quatermass experiment, science fiction was a new thing to him and was um, fairly new to Hammer as well. And um, although in hindsight, we can see the Quatermass experiment as the first stage, first part of the formula, assembling the formula that would become known as Hammer Horror, um, Val was creating something that was quite different from many of the subsequent Hammer Horror films. It's a very um, it's a very cold and a very clinical, a very cold and clinical film. Yeah. Uh, played absolutely straight with hardly any um, uh, incidental music, for example. There's there's very little incidental music in the Quest Mass experiment. And it's um, it's 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 restricted to timpani and some strings, etc. He takes that approach. Uh, to its to its you could say logical conclusion in yesterday's enemy because yesterday's enemy doesn't on at all no documentary approach that he'd um, that he applied so successfully to the Quatermass experiment he then applies to yesterday's enemy and takes it even further yeah it, it's it's super effective it really is um, so to just quickly go through the cast and characters before we move on. As Marcus was mentioning there, we have Stanley Baker, who plays Captain Alex Longford, acting uh, CO of the movie, because um, this brigadier uh, section has been absolutely decimated through fighting and retreating. Baker, we know him from Hornblower, Healing Career, The Cruel Sea, Zulu, Guns of Navarone, to name some of his war movie credits. He's BAFTA nominated for this one, Best Actor. I think it was the only uh, BAFTA nomination he got during his career, um, which is incredible, really, when you think about it. And we have Guy Rolfe as the Padre. He was in Stranger, Strangler of Bombay, King of Kyber Rifles, Land Raiders at a Western with Telly Savalas. And he played Andre Toulon in four Puppet Master films, which I think was quite funny. Uh, we have Leo McKern um, playing Max, the war correspondent. Uh, he was actually in the Australian Royal Engineers in the Second World War. And he was, as we mentioned, he was in Val Guest's The Day the Earth Caught Fire. He played Thomas Cromwell in A Man for All Seasons. And he made his name on TV in the 70s and 90s, playing uh, Horace Rumpole in Rumpole of the Bailey. Uh, when I think of him, I think of Rumpole of the Bailey. 
And don't forget the prisoner, of course, as well. Of course, of course. And then we have George Jackson as Sergeant McKenzie, the the NCO uh, of the movie, really well known as playing Cowley in The Professionals. He was the young'un in the uh, Nine Men film we covered a few weeks ago, if you remember, listeners. He was, yeah. But also, of course, you know, another member of Val Guest's repertory company because he yes mass experiment. Yeah, and he was in Hell Drivers uh, with Stanley Baker as well. And, and he was Intelligence in Great Escape. War movie uh, credits are quite good. Um, and then we have Philip Ann as Yam- uh, Yamakaze. He was an American actor of Korean descent. And he's 180 film credits, over 180. It's absolutely crazy. I was trying to get some, some cherry picks and war movies out of his credits. And it took me a while because there's just so much. Um, but he was in Halls of Montezuma, Battle Zone and Battle Him in the 50s. So his uh, repertoire's. And I think I think listeners of a certain age will remember him from the television series Kung Fu. I mean, that probably is our demographic, probably, probably right there. <laughs> um, and then we have David Oxley, who plays the Doctor. He was Sir Hugo Baskerville in 1959's Hound of the Baskervilles. And he played W. Stanley Moss, MC, in Ill Met by Moonlight. And we have Richard Pascoe, who plays Second Lieutenant Hastings. And he was in three other Hammer films. He was in uh, Sword of Sherwood Forest, The Gorgon, and Rasputin the Mad. The Mad Monk. Mad Monk, that's it. Yeah, Mad Rasputin Monk. Mad Monk. I couldn't read my own writing there. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have uh, Percy Herbert, who is no stranger to the war movie. He seems to pop up in every British war movie of the post-war period. I mean, just to rattle off a few, Wild Geese, Sea of Sand, Hilling Korea, Bridge on the River Kwai, which he acted as a... Uh, historical advisor for apparently he was the one that introduced the Colonel Bogey March into the film and then we have David Lodge as Perkins he also starred in Cockle Show Heroes with Percy Herbert and he was in Silent Enemy and Guns of Batasi there um, Wolf Morris plays the informer um, he was of Ukrainian descent and he was in Camp and Blood Island and in Ill Met by Moonlight too. So there's some really nice connections there with the cast. Loads of connections in that. Loads, wow. so much. Um, then we have Russell Walter, Walters playing the Brigadier. He's no stranger to war movies, being in Captain Horatio Hornblower, Wooden Horse, Angels 1-5, and as the ARP warden in The Cruel Sea. And then finally, we have Brian Forbes, who plays Dawson. He was an actor and writer. He wrote I Was Monty's Double. He co-wrote Cockleshell Heroes. And in terms of uh, credit acting credits, he was in Guns of Navarone and The Wooden Horse as well. So there's so many connections there um, with the cast. And it is such a strong cast. I mean, I think it's one of the finer casted war movies. There's no hangers on. There's no slack characters. Everyone brings something to this movie. And having Baker playing a hard-nosed commanding officer going against type of the sort of officer class and how they're portrayed in 50s war movies. There's no clipped up a lit here. It's very gruff. It's very rough and ready. It's almost a dry run for Lieutenant Chard in Zulu, isn't it? Yes, it really feels like it. He's really doing it absolutely justice. Um, And it's I'll mention it later, but I think it's his finest role, personally. Uh, we have a one word review this week, um, which we ask our listeners to to uh, put in their one word reviews. And we had one and I liked it because I think it sums up the whole movie for me. It's underappreciated. Um, and that's from Jonathan Webb. So I think that's a perfect word to sum up the film. Well, I, I would I would I would go along with you there, Jonathan. So I think with all this talk of uh, cast and production, I think we should get into the alley tally, talk about some kit and then get on to our favourite scenes. It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. So, Matt, Ali Tally, you know, where we run down the weapons and equipment and things that we like during the film. What's your Ali Tally pick this week? Oh, wow. Well, this, there's a lot in there. I know you'll probably talk a bit about the uniforms and such, mm. but I, I really like the costume design. I think it they 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 make it feel authentic. It feels like they've been trekking through the jungles because yeah it, it 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 does capture and i think one thing we haven't mentioned so far is it's it's probably the film's set around february 1942 because uh, baker and, and some of the others are mentioned as being um second battalion duke of wellington's regiment mm. so that would put it around um the battle of sitang bridge um 
in February of 42. And, and that was a, that was a British defeat. Mm. Um, and there was a long retreat after that. Well, there'd been a long retreat before that. It was a rearguard action. Yeah. Um, so it, it fits well within the, the historical um, uh, setting of it because it's the ostensibly there a, a brigade headquarters, which is, I think one of the guys mentions they've covered the retreat of the rest of the brigade. Yeah. Um, and then they've, they've fallen back and, and lost contact and they've spent hours going through um, Bennett Robinson swamps. Um, and there's loads of really interesting kit in this. And I think one of the things that stands out the most are, are the revolvers, the, um, I think, I think they're number two end fields. Oh, wow. um, and they get quite a lot of, you know, screen um, time, screen time considering, and, and, you know, for all the war movies that the, the British cinema made and, and were focused on, on British troops, you don't see the revolver come out a great deal no. um, when you think about it. So that was a nice little thing to see. And then uh, a couple of chaps, in, including Baker, have got uh, 1928 A1 Thompsons. He has a, a straight foregrip one. And and uh, Gordon Jackson has a really nice um, uh, classic gangster um, uh, pistol grip foregrip um, yeah. Thompson. Um, some of the Japanese weapons in the film are, are, are interesting. There, there are some quite interesting things pop up because they, they have the correct Arasaka rifles and then they also have the correct um, Type 14 Nambu pistols, which is something you don't expect British cinema to be able to, to, no. to, to grab at mm. short notice. Um, so I, I, Marcus, did Hammond have their own in-house armour or did they approach other companies like Bapti and that kind of thing? Do you know? We've gone to Bapti. I don't think there was an in-house armour because you've got a very mm. sort of film that's very really unusual for them to make. Yes, of course. They had just made <clears throat> the camp on Blood Island, um, but generally speaking, war films were not really their bag, really. And mm. there hadn't been too many. I mean, there was a film called Steel Bayonet, which is nothing like as interesting as this, unfortunately, the camp on Blood Island as well. There's a film about bomb disposal um, experts in Berlin called Ten Seconds to Hell, but there aren't very many. And so this is not the sort of thing that Hammer would have had to hand seems almost likely then there is someone like Bapti that, that were called in because a type nine a type 14 Nambu pistols you know quite quite rare and then um some of the um the light machine guns that the Japanese absolutely um smash the the the, the survivors with at the end of the film uh, are uh, I believe the um French uh, M1924 29s yeah they look um, it don't know I was thinking that with yeah, that yeah yeah standard, standard for... 56s is, is. yeah that's it yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it it's really interesting. I mean, and and some of the um the Japanese chaps have um an MP40 as well, which is interesting. So obviously in the film they needed someone to fire down from a tree. So yep. the Japanese didn't really go in for submachine guns, but they needed someone to mm. to um, to take out all of those poor brain gun positions at the end there. And yeah, um, he got the he got the weapon for that job. It's a good strong weapon representation of the film. You know, you've got your your NCOs with the submachine guns, COs with submachine guns, and you've got your you know, regular troops with SMLEs. It's a nice representation of firearms in Burma as well, using number three Lee Enfields as well. Yeah, with dial sights. With dial sights, yeah. That's a, that yeah. lovely shot it's of the firing. A bit nerdy out there, Marcus. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> that beautiful shot of the firing squad that you get, you do see some volley sights on Enfields there, um, which is you know, a mm. beautiful shot again. Um, but for me this week, one thing I really liked about this movie, and it's because we covered Long the Short and the Tall a couple of weeks ago. One thing that movie doesn't do, yes, it makes the men look like they've been sweating from the jungle heat, but their equipment is crisp, clean, like it's been at the laundrette the day before. In this one, they're all grimy, they're dirty, they're, the buttons are undone, their they're buttons missing, there's rips in uniforms. The extra believability of these men have been on the retreat for a good while. You know, men get wet and they stay wet. They don't dry out like they do in long the short and the tall after about five minutes and being of being in that hut in that movie it's just a really small thing but i appreciate the grubbiness of the kit just adds to it i like the bit where they pick up um straw from the floor obviously the one with straw in in the in the Burmese jungle yeah. but it's they're almost like rubbing off whatever would have been in that swamp yeah it's great but my little thing and i listeners will know i do enjoy uh war correspondence uh as a sort of niche within military history i think it's really interesting and to have a character who is a british war correspondent in, in a war film 
it's quite rare actually i don't think there are many representation of british war correspondents in movies i know stanley max there plays himself in uh there's is the glory but max is a very interesting character you know he's he's the sort of man at home's view of the war and it, it we'll get into later his his view of things but the, what he's wearing is very very authentic for the time he has an officer's uniform on because uh i know in the shafe document for war correspondents in 1944 and it's a bit later but uh, war correspondents were treated like officer uh, rank um, but so they could get everywhere they needed to go and report where they wanted to report. So he's wearing officer's uh, jungle uniform like the KD jacket and he has actual British correspondent, war correspondent, uh, brass shoulder titles on, which I thought was a really nice little touch because they didn't have to do it. Costume, the movie, really knew what they were doing. Um, so I really like the inclusion and uh, the Padre as well. His uniform is very is very uh, the same as Max's, but he's got his dog collar on. And as far as I, as far as I'm concerned, I think the, the kit uh, that the men are wearing is very, very authentic. I think authenticity was very important to all of them. I mean, when the film opened in America, it was distributed in America um, as it was over here by um, Columbia. Yep. Um, and when it opened in 1959 in America, Columbia asked um, General Sir Robert Manso, who was the commander of the Fifth Division in Burma from 44 to 45, to actually introduce the screenings himself. And then they asked um, uh, Bob Considine, who was a, a former war correspondent, to endorse the film as well. And if you look at the American posters, they actually carry a quote from Considine, which says um, something like, uh, um, if they ever try to make a more meaningful war picture, they'd have to fire live ammo from the screen. Yeah, it's a fantastic <laughs> quote, isn't it? That's the quote. That's the quote on the American posters. Yeah, it's fabulous. Yeah. Again, you know, this could have been an effort to try to um, make amends for the camp on Blood Island. Mm. Well, by actually sort of, you know, although no one was claiming, although the publicity for, for camp on Blood Island claimed it was based on a true story, the publicity for this didn't. And yet authenticity was, they, they, they were trying to create um, the impression that they were being true to history in another way, or at least mm. authentic in another way. Yeah. it's one, And it's also, it's one of the rare films that documents the British experience of the Far East. There aren't many. Um, you know, Long the Short and the Tall is one. In terms of British representation fighting in Burma in the Second World War, there's hardly any, and this is one of them. Um, and I think it's, found an audience going like you know since the 50s and then being maybe reintroduced um into the, the sort of british cinema consciousness i know it's turned up in a few top 10 war films you haven't seen top 50 war films you haven't seen lists um and i see it cited as oh it's a film about the british army in burma and because it's that's a rare thing as well so i think that's helped it as well and i think you know while we're on the subject of authenticity i mean the um the premier the leicester square premier was a benefit uh, in 1959, was 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 a was a benefit for the Burma Star Association, mm. and, um, and Lord Mountbatten himself um, was was there, and uh, and um, and Val Guest told me this story that he was actually sat next to Mountbatten during the, during the screening at the premiere, and uh, and Mountbatten kept nudging him during the screening, <laughs> saying, "You know, you know, Val, I, where where did you shoot? I've been there." <laughs> no, no, don't tell me, don't tell me. And he'd do this like all the way through the film. And Val said, I didn't have the heart to tell him it was Shepperton. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> oh, can you imagine how, how you'd feel if that was? Oh, my God. But you know, so, you know, on Testament. the summit, you've, you've, you've been talking about the, 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 about, about the weaponry that was used and the costumes and the whole griminess of it, you know, all mm. added to, you know, all, all of that helped to create an authentic atmosphere for the film mm, absolutely which was probably what partly prompted mount Batten to think they'd actually shot it on location i mean you couldn't really have paid val guest a greater compliment could no, you 100 percent. and really, coming no. from mount Batten himself i mean crikey you know so what is there anything in the film that uh stands out to you marcus as a as a, as a something you really like i think that uh well I, I admire all of it i think it's it is one of it's one of hammer's 10 best films some of the firearms etc is there anything in the in the film that you go, oh, that's interesting, that's cool? Um, I have a favourite scene. Is that the time to talk about that now? Favorite scenes now. The really the really chilling scene is 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 the confrontation between the Stanley Baker character and the Philip Arn character, where where the Japanese general explains his philosophy of total war. Mm. 
you know, at which point you realize that the tables have been absolutely turned. And um, and the whole in which of course then leads us into the final act, which is which is very clinical and very chilling. Mm. Um, it's it's um, I mentioned at the top of this that this is no men on a mission movie, and yesterday's enemy, you know, does certainly does not end in the way you would expect. No, men on certainly not. No, and and that that scene there when he's getting a lecture, when he's become the captive of the Japanese general, he's getting a lecture about how war is conducted. Is is absolutely chilling. I think it's it's, it's fantastic. It, well, it's electric because Baker is playing off Anne so well, um, showing all of his range. Um, there but it's the hypocrisy of baker trying to say to yamakazi oh this isn't how you you should act like treating an officer and it's like well hang on baker you treated the informer like he was something on the bottom of your shoe not half an hour before this scene happens i find that so powerful because on one hand baker is 100 percent happy to threaten this man with death and execute civilians in front of this informer to get a piece of information about a map in the grand scheme of things, they might not even make it back with this information so that the, the usefulness of what he's trying to get out of the informer is tangible to say the best. But then for Baker to expect the enemy to treat him with any respect after he's shown us the audience that he doesn't treat anyone with respect, I find it's such a powerful statement of the movie to make. And also sh- again, as like I mentioned before, show an officer in a British war movie, not, playing by the rules it's quite a, a shocking and blunt representation of the officer class um which i find so interesting mm. i mean val, val guest um equated in the book i mentioned earlier the booklet that hammer issued yesterday's enemy the film and its challenge there's a section in there where he equates captain langford's uh dilemma if you can call it that with the decision that harry s truman faced at the end of the war yeah of the um, when, when the atomic bombs were dropped, and now it's quite an extreme comparison, you know. But of course, he was making the point that um, that the British captain is makes a decision that to sacrifice a relatively small number of people in order to save a larger number of people, mm. and that's his that's his justification for what he does. Yeah, and Falgest um, wonders. In the film and its challenge in that book, you know what went through Harry S. Truman's mind when he had to make that terrible decision, you know, to drop the first atomic bomb. You know, what sort of anguish did he experience? I guess guess says something like it was it was one God fearing man's belief that a minority should die to save the majority. And I think that um, the Japanese general just you know at the end of the film when he has when he has the British captain captive, he just applies a, a purely philosophical argument. I think with Baker's character, I, I, it's such an interesting uh, characterization and performance in that he believes in um, total war for the benefit of his own men and his men are the only thing he cares about. Um, and then the interaction with uh, the, the Japanese officer played by Philip Arn, um is so interesting in that it has so many um, hints back to uh, the ma- I think he's a major or the, the Japanese intelligence officer. He mentions uh, in the last war we were allies. So he, he talks about World War One and how Jap- uh, the Japanese were allies with Britain. Um, and then he talks about the British rules of war, the conduct of war. Um, and he says, um, "Do you uh, do you have any rules for war? Then no. Now that you're fighting, now that you're not fighting spears with guns, you want a code of conduct." And it's talking about empire there, where the British Empire for, for decades before had fought um, indigenous populations and put down insurrections and such um, through small colonial conflicts where they were by far and away the you know the, the stronger power in, 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 in the conflict. And now they've, they've met a, a peer. And now Britain wants this... Uh, playing by the rules they, they want they want the conduct the good conduct of war they a yeah. gentlemanly war um which is interesting because baker doesn't really subscribe to that um no the 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 japanese intelligence officer believes he does but 
I, I, Baker's made choices before this that we've seen that 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 he hasn't that clearly show that he he understands that it's total war and that sacrifices of others have to be made. And I I think that's really interesting that that the film doesn't try and make that so clear cut. You, you can see the point that the major is making, but the film doesn't spoon feed you that. The consequences of that dilemma have all contributed to this being a quote unquote difficult watch. Mm. Yes. Um, I think that in turn has led to it being overlooked. I think so. Because it's not a film where it's not like the Dan Busters, it's not like the longest day where you can root for a hero. It's not, it's not the greatest day. No, of course. No, no. What's your favourite scene, Matt, as well? Well, I, I've got a, I've got a few. The set piece at the end of the film or towards the end of the film um, where the Japanese ambush, um, they essentially ambush uh, Stanley Baker's ambush because the Japanese troops are advancing on the village to find a colonel that's been killed while trying to gather some intelligence from a spy. And I just love the way that the full use of that set is made we see the swamp, we see a running fight down a jungle trail, we see the fight in the village. And knowing that, as you've explained, Marcus, that Robinson moved that set around into different locations and um, and, and guests would have had to have kept that all in mind, it just gives me a huge appreciation for the logistics and the choreography of that whole set piece. I think it's really impressive. Um, but in terms of character, I think... There's so many great pieces of dialogue in those moral scenes where they're discussing a should I should Baker shoot the spy or, or sorry, should he, he shoot the two Bermi civilians to, to get the spy to speak? Um, and then the 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 ruminations around um, when when uh, Baker and, and, and Arn finally meet together and they, they have that very philosophical interrogation. I, I love some of those. There's there's a bit where someone says uh, he knew there's only one way to fight a war, any war, with the gloves off. I think Baker says that. I think that's a, a very, very strong line. And I really love um, Guy Rolf as the Padre. I think his performance is is really something. He stands out in this as 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 really strong. And he he has good chemistry with Baker. I think, and, it, and they bounce off one another really well. And same too with with Philip Arn. I think he plays that um, philosophical but ruthless Japanese intelligence officer yeah. to perfection. I think it's really it's such a great performance. He's Baker's opposite number, isn't he? It's um, mm. it's Baker's match. Well, I love that bit at the end where he goes, "That is what I would have done." Oh, I still in that scene. Every time I still think Baker's going to get on that radio. I'm yeah. always rooting for him. Every time I see him go for it, I'm like, "Come on, Stan, you can do it." <laughs> As you were saying, Matt, it's it's the dialogue, I think, that makes this movie special um, and the way it goes against convention and it actually talks about, you know, the ethics and morality of war. There's a great line where, uh, as we as we said before, Baker is is, is uh, uh, saying that he's going to shoot these Burmese civilians if the informer doesn't uh, tell him what he wants to hear. Um, and they have a there's an argument with the Padre and Max, the war correspondent, where they're saying, you know, oh, it's, you know, tell him straight it's murder. Padre's trying to use his faith to convince um, Baker not to do it. And Baker turns around and he's, he sort of retorts them and, and all the things they're saying. And he, he says a brilliant line. He's like, you can't stop a whole scale retreat to have a cosy discussion on the ethics of war, um, which I think is such a great line. And then he also goes on to accuse the Padre and the, um, and the uh, war correspondent of not, being, not understanding warfare because they're not soldiers. They've not been in the fight. Um, there's not, you know, they've been with uh, Baker, you know, during this retreat, they've seen warfare, but they don't have to conduct it because, they, you know, by and, by and large, you know, they're never going to get involved in the fighting. It's not their role. So Baker says to them, you don't mind when a bomber pilot presses a button and kills a few hundred civilians. You don't mind war from a distance, only when you're involved. Such a great dialogue there. And it really makes the audience think as well about warfare, because not a lot of movies from this era really get to grips with warfare like this movie does and it's also why it's so strong because it it shows warfare it shows firefights it shows men being rough and tumble action heroes in some respects but then it do, it does exactly the opposite 
and shows people can be quite cold, callous, uncaring in warfare. And it, unfortunately, and that's a part of warfare. And I think that's why it's so strong. But I think for me, it's not, as I said, I love the whole movie. It's the whole movie is my favorite scene. I think it's my, one of my favorite war films um, ever. It's the dialogue that makes it for me. Yeah. There's even a mention of the Holocaust in there. Um, I think, I think the press uh, chap does mention. Max says, uh, you know, uh, Baker's making a point about killing a couple of people, I think to save, you know, hundreds or something. And I think Max, uh, the war cross one that turns around says, well, 2 million Jews would beg to differ, which is another great line. So maybe we should move on to final thoughts. Hello there. Sorry to interrupt. I wanted to let you know that you can now join our supporting cast over on Patreon. As thanks for your support, you'll be able to help us pick films, submit questions for guests, have first pick on brand new and exclusive merch, and much more. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. Marcus, you're our guest this week. So final thoughts on Yesterday's Enemy. I think anybody who has a passing interest in... Um post-war British cinema, or in Hammer Films, or in the careers of Stanley Baker or Val Guest, if they haven't seen this film, I'd urge them to track it down. Um, it's available on Blu-ray now. Uh, there's, a, there's a beautiful restoration available on Blu-ray um, from Powerhouse, available on DVD as well. And uh, I think it's a film that... It's a genuinely thought-provoking film. It's a difficult watch, as we said earlier. I think it's one of the highlights of Stanley Baker's career. It's one of the highlights of Val Guest's career. It's one of the highlights of the Hammer canon. And I think it's a film that actually has the power to actually make you think about post-war British war films in a different way, in a new light. 100% there, 100%. I mean, I'll echo that really, uh, Marcus. It's, I, for me, it's Stanley Baker's best work. I know people might people might get ang angered at that and say no no Zulu but I think this one he shows his range he is playing you know he was typecast as that sort of the rough and ready type but he's showing a different type of NC a different type of commanding officer in this film than you get you get the feeling that he's made it up through the ranks that at some point he was Sergeant McKenzie at some point he has been that tough NCO following orders and now he's giving them and he understands the you know the gravitas of doing it so I think it's that portrayal of a British officer that I love, but then it's Baker just being Baker. And I think it's just really a really strong performance from him. Um, and I just, I absolutely adore it because it is, it's such a special war film and it will really make you think differently about what British war movies and American war movies to, to that fact were like in the fifties. And it shows that they can be more than just running into a field, having a shooting it out with the Nazis for 90 minutes. And I think we appreciate, we can appreciate it more now as movies possibly are more nuanced than they were back then in some respects, but I, it's one of my most favorite of all time. So please check it out. Matt, what about you? I like how it makes the audience think, it asks questions of the audience. There's a, there's a little bit at the end where um, uh, the, the, the Burmese villager lady um, who speaks a little bit of English says uh, they're, they're about to leave the village. Uh, they're trying to get them to, to hide from the Japanese that are approaching. And she says, no, we're going, and and she says nobody good, British or Japanese, mm. and I think I think that's it. There isn't there is there in in that kind of situation where she's interacted with both sides and yeah. seen the cruelty of both. Mm. Um, she knows what the Japanese can be like. She's seen British murder two of her perhaps family or or villagers, um, neighbors. I think that in itself asks the question of, of the audience of what is the morality of war and, and what would you have done in, in Baker's situation? Yeah. Do you, do you go to those lengths to get that information um, on the off chance that you can get it back to, to the lines to, to perhaps avert an attack that could kill thousands? I, and as you say, I completely agree. I think, I think it's one of Baker's finest performances. I think it's fabulous. And I think the whole cast really pushes it in this. Uh, I love Gordon Jackson. He has a great line where he says, the Padre is the only, is the one man in the army that a man can talk to without doing it in triplicate. And I think that was, I thought that was a fabulous line. Um, and I've already mentioned Guy Rolf and I, I think uh, his performance as the Padre was, was fantastic. Mm. Um, brilliantly directed by Guest. And I, I think um, Arthur Grant's cinematography and the production design by Robinson is just, it pushes a limited budget 
well, not limited in in terms of of a hammer. It was, you know, as if you mentioned, Marcus, it was, you know, substantial, but it pushes the boundaries of what can be done with a soundstage. I think. Yeah. Um, I think it's I think it's a, a a brilliant film that is is solidly solidly underrated and and, and undersold now because more people need to see it. I think. Yeah, they do. It should be up there with the Crawl Sea. It should be up there with the Dam Busters. It's been one of our films we've wanted to cover for months because it's so special. Um, and we want to thank you for coming on, Marcus. It's been fantastic to hear you, from your expertise about the movie. Well, thank you for having me. It's been very interesting. Oh, thank you. It's our pleasure. And do check out Marcus's book about Hammer yes, as well. Yes, please do that as well. Um, so thanks for listening, everyone, this week. Um, as we mentioned last week as well, we are at the Tank Museum for their Fury event. And next week, there will be a special episode about our experiences there for you all to enjoy. So thanks, Marcus and Matt. Once again, thanks for joining us and we'll catch you next week, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.